Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to the Council of State Governments eCademy webinar on interstate groundwater disputes in the U.S. Supreme Court. My name is Jeff Miller and I'm a policy analyst at CSG's Western Office, also known as CSG West. Joining me in facilitating this webinar is my colleague Ann Roberts Brody. Ann is a policy analyst at the Southern Legislative Conference, uh, also known as CSG South. Ann and I want to thank Carrie Abner at CSG's national office. Uh, Carrie is managing the logistics for this webinar. Before we get to our speakers, I want to let you know that you are all in listen-only mode. If you'd like to ask a question of the speakers, you can submit it using the question box on your GoToWebinar toolbar. You can submit a question at any time during the webinar, and we will get to those questions after our presenters finish speaking. Uh, and just so you know, this webinar will be recorded and archived on the CSG Knowledge Center website. That's knowledgecenter.csg.org. Or you can just go to the csg.org website and click on eAcademy. It will also be archived on the SLC website, which is slcatlanta.org, and on the CSG West website, csgwest.org. Uh, and typically that takes uh, four or five days before those, uh, those get posted to the web. Finally, uh, please understand that the views expressed in this webinar are not necessarily the views of the Council of State Governments. Rather, they are intended to serve as a platform for discussion. So let's now turn to the reason we're all here today. More than 30 interstate compacts govern the use of water from shared lakes and rivers in the United States. Yet there's not a single legal agreement in place between states to guide the apportionment of groundwater that crosses state lines. In 2013, Nevada and Utah appeared poised to be the first two states to reach such an agreement, but ultimately that agreement was not made. Now with a long-standing groundwater dispute between Mississippi and Tennessee headed for the U.S. Supreme Court, a legal precedent governing the apportionment of interstate groundwater is imminent. And the outcome of Mississippi v. Tennessee could have implications for all contiguous U.S. states. This webinar will address the possible outcomes of Mississippi v. Tennessee the implications for interstate groundwater policy and the role of interstate compacts in resolving water disputes between states. Uh, we're fortunate today to have an excellent panel with us. I'll just give brief introductions. Their full bios are available in the CSG Knowledge Center. Our first presenter will be uh, Dr. Michael Campana. Dr. Campana is Professor of Hydrogeology and Water Resources Management at Oregon State University and he serves as Technical Director of the American Water Resources Association. His, ex his expertise and interests include hydrogeology, hydrophilanthropy, integrated water resources management, water sanitation and hygiene in developing regions, water policy, and education. Our second presenter is Professor Noah Hall. Professor Hall is an Associate Professor of Law at Wayne State University in Detroit. He is an expert in environmental and water law and focuses on issues of environmental governance, federalism, and transboundary pollution and resource management. Finally, Mr. Coleman Eldridge, director of the National Center for Interstate Compacts, will give us a brief overview of the ingredients necessary to enter into an interstate compact. Uh, all right, so we'll start with Dr. Campana. Dr. Campana, you are up. Jeff, thanks very much, and welcome to everybody out there. Uh, I would say good morning, but I suspect most of you are in the afternoon right now. It's a real privilege to be doing this. I want to thank Jeffrey and Ann for inviting me, and it's also a real privilege to be doing this with Noah Hall. Usually, when I give these webinars on Mississippi versus Tennessee, I'm doing it by myself. So forgive me, Noah, but I have to fake the water law. This time, I can stick to the uh, water issues and, and rely on Noah to correct me where I'm wrong. And uh, let's go from my logo-rich cover page to the um, next slide, which gives a, just a little bit of an orientation in terms of what will I be talking about. And you can see it right here. And as I said, I'm going to stick to the uh, pretty much the water issues and not delve into the, um, certainly not into the water law. And um, let's go and find out about uh, why I'm really doing this. I was, um, um, if we go to the next slide, I was uh, asked to um, um, 
give my comments on the Mississippi versus Tennessee. At that time, it was Mississippi versus Memphis case. Gosh, almost a decade ago, I didn't realize that until I actually put this together. Tom Charlier, who's a reporter for the Memphis Commercial Appeal, contacted me in 2007 and um, asked if I had heard about the case, and I had heard a little bit about it. And um, I also knew something about the Memphis sand aquifer because I used to teach a course in regional hydrogeology. And he solicited some, some comments from me. And that was followed up a couple of weeks later. Mississippi Public Radio called me up and uh, interviewed me. And the reason they did that, uh, Tom actually explained this, is that the, the local experts were reluctant to talk to either side for fear of being perceived as, um, say, going against their potential clients or whatever. And so they had to reach all the way across, almost across the um, country, to get someone from Oregon who was born in New York City, no less, and um, I became really intrigued by this case. I don't have any formal involvement, but I have given a number of webinars and uh, constantly update them. But what struck me first off about this particular case is that this is a story that's made for the Western USA. Water quantity is at issue. We've got a lot of groundwater issues in the West, say more so, or we thought more so than the East, and a lot more potential for conflict. And I'd also say, and we hydro people are fond of putting hydro in front of other words and making hydro irony and hydro hegemony and hydro this, hydro that. But the irony of this is that you have two states in one of the USA's wettest region adjacent to one of the world's largest river, and what are they doing? They're arguing over groundwater, which is something you can't see. So I just really, this is tailor-made for classroom presentations. Next slide, please. And um, I think most of you know where Tennessee is. And uh, Memphis and Shelby County are in the southwestern corner of uh, Memphis, uh, uh, Tennessee, as shown on the map, uh, abut the Mississippi River. And Mississippi is uh, right below the western end of Tennessee. And we'll also be talking about DeSoto County, which is in Mississippi, just across the state line. So if we keep going on to the next slide, we'll get into this right away. Let's get a little bit of background. Um, Memphis has a city-owned utility, pretty, pretty well known, Memphis Light Gas and Water. They provide water, electricity, which they buy from the Tennessee Valley Authority, and gas, and they build themselves as the nation's largest three-service utility, light, gas, and water. They supply water to about 1.1 million people. That's um, more than just the city of Memphis, but also a fair part of Shelby County. And their predecessors started pumping groundwater back in the, in the uh, 20s. Now, the groundwater they pump is, is primarily from a, a geologic formation known as the Memphis Sand Aquifer, but it's also known as the Sparta Sand or the Middle Claiborne Aquifer, and also the Fort Pillow Sand. Now, the daily pumpage is given right there is uh, pretty substantial, 160 to 200 million gallons per day. And um, in the West, we use acre feet. That's about 490 to 615 acre feet per day. For those of you who aren't familiar with acre feet, that's essentially the amount of water um, that would cover an acre of land to a depth of one foot. And um, most of you are familiar with football fields, US football fields, if you cover a football field uh, to a depth of about one foot, you have about an acre foot. Now, Alan Cameron, who was an attorney working for Mississippi on this, claims that Memphis is the world's largest city relying solely on groundwater. And um, it's not the city that pumps the most groundwater, but it relies solely upon groundwater for their supply. So let's go on to the next slide, get a little bit further into this. The Memphis sand, okay, what is that? Well, it's a geologic formation. It underlies um, a fair chunk of uh, that region there, the Mid-South, about 10,000 square miles beneath Arkansas, Tennessee, and Mississippi, and also under Kentucky. It's up to 900 feet thick, and it's what we hydrologists call a very coarse sand. It means the sand grains are relatively large. And that's good because that generally means that the pore spaces, and that's the region through which the water flows, this is not like river flow, are also very large. Now, there's some clay and silt interbedded in there, okay? But in general, the Memphis sand has very good water storage and transmissive properties. It's a hydrogeologist's dream, let me tell you. Um, it's replenished via precipitation. 
in that particular part of the country, they get about 55 inches of precip a year, and that's on an average annual basis. And it's on the outcrop belt in western Tennessee and Mississippi, which the next uh, page will show you. Now, on the MLGW website, I just looked the other day, it says there's 100 trillion gallons of water in the Memphis sand aquifer. That's over 300 million acre feet. That's what MAF means. Now, that's an awful lot of water. Now, keep in mind, that does not mean that you can recover all that water. Pumping groundwater is like pumping oil or gas. You can't get it all out of the ground, and in fact, you probably don't want to get it out of the ground. So if we go to the next diagram, I think we show a picture of what the Memphis sand might look like. This is a cross-section of the earth beneath the Memphis area. And Memphis is kind of about right in the middle. Uh, the Mississippi River is just a little, little tiny um, indentation or dimple right near the Memphis um, area. And of course, Memphis sits on a bluff, well known for that. Now, the rocks beneath Memphis are shown in blue. Those are the less permeable rocks, the ones that aren't very good at conducting and yielding water. And then the light-colored ones, the Memphis sand, the Fort Pillow sand, and the Cretaceous aquifer way down at the bottom, those are the desirable formations. And the Memphis sand, as you can see, uh, bulges there right below Memphis, and is, that's where it's its maximum thickness. Now, if you look at the right of the diagram, you'll see a vertical dashed line that delineates the boundary between Tennessee and Mississippi, you'll notice that the Memphis sand uh, outcrops or shows up at the surface there, and that's where the recharge can come from. Rainfall on that area gets seeps into the Memphis sand and provides some degree of replenishment. Now, also keep in mind that these diagrams prepared by geologists exaggerate the vertical dimension at the expense of the horizontal dimension. If you look in the bottom, you'll see the horizontal dimension is, um, it probably covers about 150 miles, but the vertical covers only about 4,000 feet. And that's to show the delineation of the formations, because if we did this diagram to scale, it would show up as simply a, a line just running across the page. So it wouldn't really work too well. So let's go on to the next slide. And by the way, I do have a list of references at the end of the slide. So what about the issues here? Well, Memphis Light, Gas, and Water pumps from 10 well fields, and that's more than 175 wells. Now, the wells are concentrated in fields because the aquifer does not have uniform properties everywhere. Some places are better yielders of water than others, and so they're clumped into fields. And it also makes distribution and, and treatment a little bit easier. Now, the water quality is very good. In fact, MLGW does not treat the water extensively. They chlorinate it, of course, and, and provide a little bit of filtration. But it's really good quality water. In fact, it's much better than if they had to take it out of the Mississippi River. Now, the state of Mississippi has claimed that uh, the utility is stealing its groundwater, about 24 million gallons per day and 365 billion gallons in total between 1965 and 2005. They claim that this water is being taken from underneath their boundaries. And at one time, Mississippi actually listed Memphis as the biggest user of its groundwater. So let's explore this a little further by going on to the next slide and we'll see what we're, what we're getting into right here. This diagram right here, this little table is prepared uh, by a student of one of my good colleagues, Ken Rainwater, and if that's not a good name for a hydrologist, I don't know what is. Ken's a, a civil engineer at Texas Tech University, and his student compiled this list of state groundwater allocation laws. Now, we're not going to go through this. The only ones that we're really interested in today, if you look down at the, in the first column, the third entry down, you'll see reasonable use, and then you'll go across to the ownership. And Mississippi, the state presumably owns the groundwater or owns the right to the groundwater. Now, in Tennessee, the, the landowner has the right to own the groundwater or actually the right to pump the groundwater. And that's a fundamental difference that shows up, and I'm sure Noah's going to deal with that. He knows about this far more than I do. So let's go on to the next slide. But the, the fact that Mississippi claimed that it owned the groundwater uh, became important in certain aspects of the case. This diagram here simply shows what happens when you pump water from a well. The water level in the aquifer, that's the, um, uh, the tan-colored region, and the blue-colored region is the aquifer that 
actually has the water in it, the cone or the water level in the well is depressed. And the farther away you get from the well, the less depressed it is. And this simply illustrates that you're drawing a lot of the water from the immediate vicinity of the world of the well, but you can also affect areas beyond the well. And if we go to the next slide, this becomes very clear. Uh, this diagram here shows the um, city of Memphis is the uh, um, kind of the central area there, and you'll notice those ten black dots. Those are the city's well fields. You can barely make out the line between Mississippi and Tennessee. That's right below where the, well, that's where the black dots stop, really. And then the yellow area that extends beyond the city, that's supposedly or allegedly the parts of the um, uh, land where the water is being taken from. And this is what Mississippi is complaining about. And of course, this is, this is just the way groundwater works. It doesn't stop at state boundaries or any kind of boundaries. It, except for hydrogeologic boundaries. It just keeps going. It doesn't care about politics, really. The next slide shows something uh, a little more graphic. Again, these were prepared by Alan Cameron, who was representing the state of Mississippi. Here's, again, the city of Memphis is shown in pink. And you'll notice those uh, kind of wavy lines that are running approximately north-south. Now, if you're familiar with topographic maps, and I'm sure many of you are, you'll notice, gee, that looks kind of like a topographic map with contour lines showing the elevation of the land surface. And actually, you'd be pretty much right. What those lines show are the elevations of the water level in the Memphis Sand Aquifer. And on each one of those lines, there is a number. It's feet above mean sea level, and that simply means that that's the elevation of the water in the Memphis Sand Aquifer at that particular point. Now what happens is, just like topographic maps, things move from where the contour lines are high to where the contour lines are low. And so the groundwater in this case is flowing, the, the high values are off to the right, and it's flowing in towards Memphis. And Cameron has actually drawn some yellow, or pardon me, red arrows showing paths of water, and of course they're emanating from Mississippi and they're flowing to wells in Memphis. And this clearly indicates, in, in his mind, that water is being taken from beneath Mississippi. Now one thing, and I'm sure some of you are wondering about this, well, is anybody else pumping from this aquifer other than, than Memphis-like gas and water? And the answer is yes. Pumpage is also being conducted in DeSoto County, which is the area that's surrendering its water. And those, that pumping is not shown on this map. So this is a highly idealized version of the, should I say, the truth. And if we put in some other wells, it would be far more complicated. Now the next slide is a three-dimensional depiction of what we're seeing right here. This is actually um, a fascinating slide. It shows in a three-dimensional fashion the depression of the water level caused by the pumping in Memphis. And that depression of the water level extends into DeSoto County, that's the arrow on the right there. And the interesting thing is the well fields to which the water is flowing are shown as, and I love this, black holes. And we all know what black holes represent. In the galaxy, there are places where things enter and things never come out. And I suspect that when this was presented to people, they were people said, yes, Memphis, so this water is going into a black hole in Memphis. So anyway, and again, keep in mind that there's no pumpage going on, or at least shown in this diagram. It's as if Memphis, like gas and water, were, were all by itself and uh, just pumping all the water. So let's go on to the next slide, and we'll get away from some of these diagrams. Now the plot thickens here. This is pretty good. University of Memphis professors Brian Waldron and Daniel Larson they showed in a paper that, that was in a, a publication of the Journal of the American Water Resources Association that prior to pumping from the Memphis sand aquifer, groundwater flowed into Tennessee under natural conditions. Okay? And they refuted that Tennessee um, was stealing M Mississippi groundwater. And in fact, according to their claims, the pumping in DeSoto County, again, that's Mississippi, may have stolen 10.7 million gallons per day of Tennessee's water. And those links I have there, if you go on those links, you'll be able to find more information. I didn't put their details here because of the lack of time, but they show some uh, graphics, some diagrams, much like Cameron showed 
indicating that, that there's some water that's flowing into DeSoto County and not as much flowing into Tennessee. So this adds a little fuel to the fire, at least on the Memphis side. So let's go to the next diagram, or pardon me, the next uh, slides, and we'll get into some of the observations. Now these are just my assessments or some of the things that stuck out with me. Uh, to me. Now, prior to the lawsuit in 2005, the first time Mississippi took this uh, to court, the three states were involved in discussions about developing a plan to manage the aquifer. Good idea. You've got to allocate the waters and the aquifers. Mississippi withdrew from the discussions and then filed suit in February 2005, so something apparently wasn't going too well for them. And as I mentioned before, the lawsuit seemed far more appropriate to the um, arid western USA, and I'm kind of wondering, could this be the shape of things to come, because we're not used to having the East having such um, fights over um, water uh, availability. Now we've got one in, in uh, Tennessee and Mississippi. Of course, those of you know that the Apalachicola Chattahoochee Flint River in Florida, Georgia, and Alabama is causing a huge flood fight, mainly among um, or between Florida and um, Georgia. So that's a, another Western type thing. So if we go to my second observation slide, we see that um, these are some other things. Yes, um, Mississippi, remember, um, they supposedly own their own groundwater, and they claimed that it was allocated to them when they became a state, I believe, in 1817. And so one of the things that they claimed was they were acting in the public trust to protect the groundwater from, let's say, the depredations of Tennessee and uh, Memphis. So they said, hey, we're acting as good stewards, taking care of the water for our citizens. You also have a case here where you have institutional asymmetry. You have a state suing a uh, kind of a lower political entity, a city, and that was the original case was Memphis versus, um, or Mississippi versus Memphis Light Gas and Water, or the city of Memphis, um, in a dispute over water resources, and Tennessee was brought in uh, later on because they had an interest in this because they allocate water. Um, but I wondered, are new approaches needed for resolution of such disputes? Okay, why can't we just keep it between the state and the city? The last and the, the third bullet here is, should we establish regional interstate agencies to manage transboundary groundwater? And I'm sure my colleague Noah Hall will have a lot to say about this. And let's go to the last page of these observations, the things that I think are important. One thing is, and this may seem obvious, it's certainly harder to prove that groundwater is being diverted, say, when compared to surface water. If you're diverting surface water, okay, you can see someone throws a pump in the river or something like that, and you can say, look, they're taking water out. Groundwater is a little subtler, and um, we rely on some of the maps, such as the ones I showed, to indicate that groundwater is flowing from one region to another region. It's also possible to divert groundwater by getting by diverting it from a stream. If you pump to a high degree and you're close enough to a stream, you can actually deplete the flow in the stream, and that's actually uh, your stealing water in that case. And there's also an issue, and, and um, I can't get into this, that ML or don't have the time, that um, this was promulgated by uh, two University of Tennessee, Kentucky, uh, uh, Knoxville faculty members in, my gosh, over 15 years ago, questioned whether Memphis had the right to pump so much groundwater. So that's something that who knows may come up in this particular case. And so finally, we're getting about to the end here. We run to the next slide. Let me just say um, what my dream is. And what I would love to see come out of this is that a compact is developed. And, and Noah will talk about the potential one that almost occurred between Nevada and Utah. I'd love to see the three states get together and put all this nonsense behind them and come up with a compact or uh, an agreement. Um, there are several things they could use as templates, construct a, a management model, in other words, a computer model, and agree to allocation of water. If it's a true compact, then it does need congressional approval. And as Jeffrey mentioned in the beginning, there aren't any compacts in the US that deal solely with groundwater. This would be a first. And it would be a template for future and hopefully avert some potential groundwater conflicts. And it would be a chance to set a precedent. And I might add, and I'm sure Noah will mention this, that a lot of people on the world stage 
are, are looking at this case and hoping the Supreme Court does something because um, a lot of uh, foreign governments and foreign courts take their cues from the Supreme Court. So this would be really something. And the last thing is, well, wherever there's a dream, there's a nightmare. And so my nightmare is on the next slide that if we um, Supreme Court does not get a ninth member and ties when this thing comes up, four to four, then the status quo prevails, and that's kind of the end. So about ready to wrap up now. The next slide has some additional information that you may find useful. Um, access to my more detailed PowerPoint that has a lot more geology. And actually, um, a very good article was written by Boyce Upholt in the Atlantic, uh, the online Atlantic, uh, just about a year ago called An Interstate Battle for Groundwater. And you can access it from that one. The interesting thing is in the commercial appeal just a few days ago, there was a, an article by Tom Charlier about Memphis lawmakers planning a bill to protect the aquifer. And this is kind of interesting because they were wanted to protect uh, a well that or wells that were going to be drilled by the Tennessee Valley Authority to provide cooling water for a power plant in southwest Memphis and a lot of locals were concerned about this about their pumping water and possibly contaminating the atmosphere and um, those kind of things. So that's a short article. I'd encourage you to read it. So, uh, and they're actually we're talking about maybe forming a regional agency, which of course would be regional just in terms of Western Tennessee. But um, if you want to do it right, you really need to bring the other ones in too. And then right below that, I have something about one acre foot equals this, and a football field, even old Mrs. Field. Uh, could be used as a measuring tool. So I think that's about it. Let's wrap it up and see what else comes up. We've got some references. Some of those are online. I give the URLs there, so if you want to check them out. And I think that's about it, Carrie. I think I got one more to go. I want to thank everybody. And this is a classic. Um, all of us Western water wonks have this postcard somewhere in our office. This is from duckboy.com, and uh, I've rewritten it. Mississippi and Memphis representatives discuss water allocation without their lawyers. Of course, the mountains in the background should give it away that we're not in western Tennessee anymore, folks. So anyway, I want to thank you very much, and uh, I'll take your questions at the end, and I'm anxious to hear what uh, my esteemed colleague Noah Hall has to say. So again, thanks very much. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Campana. And uh, as, as Dr. Campana said, you can submit questions anytime using the, uh, the, the toolbar on the right side of your screen. And uh, please feel free to submit those, and we'll get to them uh, at the end. Uh, so I'll get right to uh, Professor Hall. Professor Hall, you are up. Great. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Michael. That was a, an absolutely superb presentation. Uh, you've made my job very easy, and um, I, it'll actually allow me to shorten uh, the comments I had planned quite considerably and maybe get into questions that much sooner. Uh, so thank you all, listeners, for taking time out of your day to hear about this. Um, I, what I'd like to do is just give you a very short overview of the applicable law for transboundary natural resources, including water, uh, which will only take a moment or two. Uh, and then look at how that law has been applied uh, to interstate surface water, primarily uh, rivers to a lesser extent lakes, and then come back to this Mississippi-Tennessee dispute, see uh, uh, what's up for grabs and what's up for stakes in uh, the Supreme Court's case in terms of changes to the law and how it might affect states' rights, um, and then look at uh, some alternatives and, and potentially better approaches. So first of all, the law of uh, transboundary resources, whether it's a river that forms a state boundary or may, perhaps a river that flows from one state into another, maybe two, sh two states uh, share shoreline on a lake such as the Great Lakes, uh, the same law would apply, the same legal rules would apply to shared airsheds, uh, and of course, uh, transboundary populations of wildlife, uh, such as salmon and migratory birds. And the law for all of these resources, for over a hundred years uh, of United States Supreme Court precedent, has been quite simple and uniform. It's sharing. That is to say that states, in the eyes of the U.S. Supreme Court for a hundred years now, do not own transboundary water or migratory birds, 
or the air that's at one moment above their state. These, the states share these resources with other states. And when sta one state's use is interfering with another state's use, the Supreme Court has, has created a, a fairly common sense set of principles to resolve those disputes. It's typically called equitable apportionment when you're talking about shared water, uh, but the exact same doctrines apply to other shared resources, usually with the, the term interstate nuisance. And interstate nuisance and equitable apportionment, uh, the, the law of sharing in the Supreme Court, if you will, is essentially the same as the law of sharing between uh, even two neighbors, um, uh, you know, two homeowners. Uh, it, the law is pretty straightforward. Uh, no state has an absolute right to these resources, but instead each state has a shared interest in the resource, uh, and that shared interest, when it conflicts, needs to be resolved in an equitable and fair and reasonable way, which is a fancy way of saying that the court will look at all of the competing factors, the needs for the water, harm from using the water, alternatives to the use of the water, uh, and, and what the water body provides, and figure out essentially what is the fairest, most reasonable way to resolve the dispute in a way that creates the least harm to both states. Uh, and typically, the United States Supreme Court puts a very heavy emphasis on uh, the use of the water for domestic needs, for drinking water, for municipal supply, uh, because the Supreme Court is, of course, very reluctant to shut off a state's water supply, especially when that water supply is essential for, uh, for drinking in a municipal population, uh, even taking into account the harms on the other state. So that's the law of, of shared or interstate, I should say that's the law of interstate resources, it's a law of sharing, uh, and that's how it's been applied to surface water, using this equitable apportionment doctrine. Now, what's uh, the twist in Mississippi, Tennessee, is that Mississippi is arguing before the United States Supreme Court not that it has a shared interest in the groundwater and that Tennessee is abusing its shared interest, but rather that Mississippi has an absolute ownership of the groundwater that at any given moment is located on its side of the dotted line boundary that would run below ground from the surface boundaries of the state. And the Mississippi's argument then is that because it has absolute ownership over the water in its state, even if that water is transboundary in nature, um, it, any use or interference of that water by Tennessee amounts to conversion of the state of Mississippi's property and Tennessee is liable for tens of millions of dollars to the state of Mississippi for the use of Mississippi's water. Now, I, I want to be very clear. Uh, it, it might sound, you know, like I've got some bias in favor of one state or another. I've not uh, been, uh, I've not uh, taken any legal position on behalf of one state or the other, but I have written extensively uh, on this dispute. Uh, and I've had communications with lawyers actually from both states, uh, and I certainly have my my take, uh, and, I, and I don't want to hide that. But equally clear is, is being objective about what the law is and what, what has been established for 100 years. Mississippi's claim is novel. No two ways about it. Now, they might persuade, Mississippi might persuade the Supreme Court to adopt its novel claim, but what Mississippi is asking the Supreme Court to do and which is to create state ownership of water, is something the Supreme Court rejected expressly in a line of cases dating back about 100 years, as I've said. Uh, and in fact, the Supreme Court has called the idea of state ownership of water or natural resources a legal fiction. I believe they called it a 19th century legal fiction. Uh, so when Michael was mentioning, for example, before that Mississippi claims ownership of the groundwater in its state, and many states do this. It's quite common in Western state constitutions for the state to declare ownership over its state water. We see it in some Eastern constitutions as well. Many statutes uh, across the country 
have declarations of state ownership of water or wildlife or other natural resources. And those might be useful as far as uh, resolving legal disputes between the state and private property owners within the state. But those declarations of state ownership have been given no weight by the United States Supreme Court in disputes between states over shared resources. Uh, for the simple reason that if two states declare ownership over a resource that's shared, logically, neither declaration, or at least uh, one of the declarations, must be incorrect. And logically, they both probably are. Now, what Mississippi, though, is asking you to do is to restore this idea or, or, or go back to this failed idea of state ownership of resources. And in the Mississippi versus Tennessee case, of course, the only natural resource that's up for issue is interstate groundwater. Now, interstate groundwater is a tremendously important resource uh, that was really detailed before. Uh, I would just add that as there is more and more uh, pressure to protect and conserve surface waters, lakes, rivers, and streams, uh, both for environmental protection uh, and to manage them for competing uses, groundwater is becoming an increasingly important resource for states. Uh, it's really where most of the growth in water use is occurring, is in groundwater. We're not withdrawing more surface water, by and large, nationwide. But our groundwater use is growing, and growing quite steadily. So how the Supreme Court resolves the law of groundwater is going to be tremendously important, given the importance of that resource. But I would also look at it as a potential precedent or a change in direction for all kinds of other shared resources, beginning with surface water, looking at wildlife, uh, migratory birds, any resource, natural resource that crosses state lines. If the Supreme Court is going to adopt Mississippi's argument for groundwater, I think it at least opens the door to uh, th those legal changes for other resources as well. Uh, none of this, I think, would be a good direction to take. Uh, I think sharing is logically and legally the only way that two parties uh, that share a border can get along long term. We can't give absolute rights to one neighbor over the other. You have to give them both the shared obligation to use the resource wisely uh, in a way that both uh, respects each other's interests and protects the resource itself. And uh, the final point then that I'd make on this, which will then transition to our next speaker, uh, is that one of the strengths and positive results of the Supreme Court's law of sharing is that it encourages states to reach cooperative agreements with each other uh, instead of resolving their disputes in court. Because the Supreme Court doesn't give absolute rights to the water to either state, but instead each state has a shared interest in it, it typically leads states to negotiate cooperative agreements, uh, sometimes under the direct guidance of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court will say, boy, you states should go and reach an agreement over how to resolve this dispute instead of litigating it before us. Uh, and the most common form for those agreements to take in a formal sense is interstate compacts, which we'll hear about more in a moment. Uh, but they could also be informal agreements. They could be executive agreements between governors. Uh, the point is that if the two states develop an agreement proactively, uh, it avoids not just disputes, but unsustainable use of the resource, unnecessary harm to the water body, uh, often through proactive management, there's ways to essentially find solutions, not to create more water, but allow uh, water needs to be met simultaneously without harming each other. The Supreme Court is not very good at fashioning those kinds of remedies when faced with a dispute. It's best done in a, in a cooperative setting uh, and really by technical experts from both states. So with that, I'm going to turn it over on interstate compacts. Uh, to the final speaker. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Professor Hall. Uh, so I think I'll uh, turn it over quickly to Coleman Eldridge. Coleman is with the National Center for Interstate Compacts. Coleman? Thank you so much, Jeff, and uh, thank you to Ann and Jeff for the invitation to, to join you all. Uh, and, and thank you to uh, both of the previous presenters uh, for this fascinating uh, uh, conversation. Uh, it, it is 
ripe for an interstate compact. Uh, and so thank you for the easy setup there as well. Uh, very quickly, what Ann and Jeff have asked me to do is to give a little background uh, to the interstate compact mechanism. Uh, the, the National Center for Interstate Compacts was founded in 2005, uh, and uh, we've been fortunate to work with many of the 200 plus compacts that exist. Uh, and so uh, it's what we do day in and day out, working with states, uh, figuring out uh, ways to uh, to settle disputes and to uh, to answer uh, large and small questions with interstate uh, and multi-jurisdictional uh, cooperation. The interstate compact mechanism actually predates the founding of the United States. Uh, it was used by the King uh, of uh, England to settle land disputes. Uh, what has changed over the course of the last century or so has been the establishment of administrative agencies uh, to oversee uh, the day-to-day -day operations of uh, the interstate compact. Uh, the compact mechanism is enshrined in the U.S. Constitution. Article 1, Clause 10, Section 3 uh, gives the power to the states to enter into uh, these uh, collaborative agreements so long as it does not uh, challenge or change uh, or challenge the federal supremacy. Uh, there are, as I said before, over 200 active compacts and uh, each state belongs to roughly two dozen compacts. So uh, even the three states or so that we're talking about now have a, uh, a long and storied history with uh, the interstate compact mechanism. There are three primary uses for interstate compacts. Uh, the first is to resolve boundary disputes, which uh, harkens to its uh, original uh, utilization. The second, as we have been discussing this afternoon, is the management of shared natural resources. And the third, as I mentioned before, is to set up these administ administrative agencies uh, which have jurisdiction over a wide variety of state concerns, uh, some of which are state transportation, environmental matters, education, public safety, and licensure. There are some key benefits to the interstate compact mechanism. First, uh, it is effective and it is efficient. Uh, it, it allows its members, member states, which are usually uh, no less than two, but can be as many as 50 states, uh, it, it allows those member states of a compact to achieve economies of scale. It's flexible, so uh, what you will see throughout uh, the 200-plus the compacts that are in existence is that one size does not fit all, and so it, it is able to uh, change and morph into what uh, what the situation calls for. It allows for dispute resolution among the states. So uh, again, uh, that harkens to uh, what the previous two presenters have, have talked about. And it, it believes in accommodating uh, state and federal partnerships as well as uh, the recognition that cooperative behaviors oftentimes lead to win-win situations. The, the landscape for interstate compacts has evolved over time, uh, but some of uh, the, the consistent uh, markers of the utilization of, of interstate compacts uh, are, are as follows. Uh, the threat of federal, federally mandated solutions, uh, advances in technology in an increasingly mobile world, and its proven track record over its two century plus uh, utilization. Some operational benefits uh, of utilizing the interstate compact mechanism is that oftentimes it allows for a national data and information sharing system. Uh, they utilize uniform compact language, so each member state understands that they are playing by the same rules and that, that compact legislation uh, looks the same state to state. It has a proven governance structure. Uh, allows for a national interface with external stakeholders and national organization, uh, organizations, allows for coordination with other interstate compacts, and allows for the hiring of uh, staff if need be. The development of an interstate compact quickly uh, usually comes in three distinct phases, the advisory phase, the drafting phase, and the education and enactment phase. The advisory phase usually begins with uh, a composition uh, of state officials, stakeholders, and issue experts who examine the issues, look at the current policy spectrum, 
examine best practices and alternative structures, and then examine the need for congressional consent, as well as then establishing recommendations as to the contents of a possible interstate compact. In the drafting phase, uh, which is composed of five to eight state, uh, state officials, stakeholders, and issue experts, usually having some uh, overlap with the advisory committee and phase, uh, that uh, phase allows for the, the crafting of an interstate compact and allows for uh, that compact to be uh, circulated among specific states and relevant stakeholder groups for comment. The third phase, the education and enactment phase, brings back that drafting team to consider all comments and incorporate those into a final compact. That compact is then circulated among the advisory group, and then it is released to the states for their consideration uh, and legislative enactment. Typically, compacts have a, uh, a, a, uh, a very typical uh, governance structure, and that is the establishment of an interstate commission uh, that then has the ability to create uh, committees. Uh, usually an executive committee is, is one of the first that are established. And, and as I said before, that, uh, that commission and committee usually then has the power within that uh, compact to hire additional staff if uh, deemed necessary. And finally, interstate compacts uh, are usually financed uh, in a handful of ways. Uh, compacts allow for financing uh, for a couple of very distinct reason, uh, reasons, to allow for business meetings and the standing, uh, and standing committee meetings, to support staff and infrastructure, uh, to hire and utilize legal counsel if needed, and to design a website or data systems if necessary. Those three primary options of financing are, are normally uh, user fees to be established by the commission, grants and awards from federal agencies or private foundations, and state appropriations. Uh, and, and that's usually a, a last resort, but uh, there are many state, uh, many uh, compacts, especially the 50 state compacts, that usually have some sort of, uh, of state appro appropriation, as well as a combination of those previous two. Uh, I know that was a lot to throw at you and a lot of information, but if you have any further questions, please feel free to contact us. Our, website is www.csg.org uh, backslash NCIC. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Ann for uh, question and answers. Well, thank you, Mr. Aldridge, for those wonderful insights. And as you all may imagine, we have received several questions during this webinar. Our first question goes to Dr. Campana. Dr. Campana, have there been any interstate disputes that you are aware of over other natural resources, such as oil and natural gas, that can offer lessons for how to resolve disputes over groundwater? That's an excellent question, and um, I can't think of any offhand. I suspect Noah probably knows more about this than I do, since he his... his um, um, purview extends beyond water, but I, I actually, actually, um, l let me let me take that back. There's a um, in um, in in the oil patch in dealing with oil. This may um, come into play. There's a there's a concept called unitization, where um, let's say a number of different companies are um, intent upon developing an oil field, and sometimes what they will do is um, they will assign one company to actually operate the field and will specify allocations like you know company x gets x percent and company y gets so so you know so on and so forth and in that way they um they develop the resource in um an organized way so that the field is not damaged by um the problem with having a common pool resource where it's kind of like everybody for him or herself. And um, this has actually been, I have a colleague of mine, Todd Jarvis at Oregon State, who is actively looking at this, and it's actually been used in, um, um, in the development of a small um, groundwater operation, well, small relative to what we're talking about here, uh, where a number of farmers have pooled their water rights, which is highly unusual 
at least in the West, such that they can develop or extract water from a field for the agricultural operations in an organized manner without worrying about one person kind of uh, you know playing the lonesome the lone ranger or something so that's about the closest thing I can think of um, I'm, sh I'm sure there have been interstate um, disagreements over other resources uh, I I'm just not privy to that field though so I apologize for that Thank you, Dr. Campana. Uh, we also have a question for Professor Hall. Professor Hall, the dispute between Nevada and Utah was briefly referenced earlier in this webinar, and the asker of this question ha is wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on that dispute and the interstate compact that very nearly emerged as a result. Sure. So. Um well, I'll start by saying what I was wrong about. Uh, back in 2013, I was doing quite a bit of work in Utah on the Snake Valley dispute between Utah and Nevada. And at the time, I predicted that it would uh, most likely be the first interstate groundwater dispute to make its way to the Supreme Court. And uh, so I was wrong on that score. Uh, so you might want to take everything else I'm going to say with a grain of salt. Uh, that said, though, the, we, we knew at the time, and, and it still hasn't changed, that the Snake Valley Aquifer dispute, which is, uh, I'll give you the very short overview of it, about 30-second overview. Essentially, it's an aquifer. It uh, doesn't hold a lot of water, certainly not in comparison to the Sands Aquifer down in Memphis. It's a relatively small aquifer with a relatively low recharge rate uh, that uh, straddles the Utah-Nevada border. Uh, the water in the aquifer right now is primarily used to support agriculture and ranching in that uh, Nevada-Utah border region. But Nevada's plan for the groundwater is to pipe it to Las Vegas to augment the municipal water supply for Las Vegas. Uh, this has caused, of course, a lot of opposition in Utah, and um, uh, it's become a very—it was a very politically controversial issue. Now, putting the politics aside, though. Uh, at the agency level, uh, frankly, the, the technical folks for Utah and Nevada crafted a superb interstate agreement, uh, draft interstate agreement between Utah and Nevada over the Snake Valley Aquifer uh, that I think should serve as a model for other states that want to do cooperative groundwater management. The Snake Valley Aquifer Agreement has provisions to ensure the water is used sustainably, to exchange information and monitor the, the aquifer, develop research, guard against environmental impacts, uh, allow for users to essentially have um, uh, some fairness in, in their disputes with each other over uh, when water when water tables lower. Um, and overall, it essentially would, would be a, uh, not just a win, I think, for the states, but for the aquifer itself. Unfortunately, uh, Utah's governor has not uh, signed the agreement, uh, essentially, and I think this is an important reality for folks who do interstate work and, and state leaders. Um, unfortunately, voters don't often reward cooperation, and it seems that politics sometimes uh, pushes state leaders to take absolute positions in defense of their state's interest rather than uh, compromise and cooperate. And I believe the Utah governor uh, was faced with this dilemma. His advisors, I think, were informing him, and we have public documents to this effect, that the agreement was the, the best overall approach uh, for Utah and uh, was a sensible way to resolve this. But uh, politically, I think um, sharing water with Nevada and especially Las Vegas is very unpopular in Utah. And even if it's what common sense and the law would ultimately require, uh, I think the residents of Utah and and then eventually persuading the political leaders of Utah just didn't want to didn't want to share, didn't want to cooperate, and don't like the idea of Utah water going to Las Vegas in a pipeline. So uh, I think it's an important lesson that while cooperation is, uh, makes the most sense and is, is what the law requires right now, um, uh, there's a lot of political uh, there's a lot of political pressure sometimes to um, uh, 
to, to take a hard approach with one's neighbors. I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Professor Hall. Our next question goes back to Dr. Campana. Does equitable apportion depends on accurate measurement of available groundwater? Many states, as you know, don't know exactly how much groundwater they have. Will states need to make significant investments to determine the amount of available groundwater before they can enter into an interstate compact based on equitable apportion? Boy, that's, that's another wonderful question. Um, you know, one of the things that you can do is allocate water according to a proportion instead of an absolute amount. When, for example, in, in my talk I said, you know, MLGW has in their website there are 100 trillion gallons of water um, in the Memphis sand aquifer. Well, as I said, who knows whether that number is actually correct, and then again there's the issue of how much of that can they actually extract. Um, and there are also other issues too. You can extract a certain amount, but do you want to extract that amount because you, you may get certain deleterious effects occurring with that. You may get land subsidence. You may get draining of streams, etc. So you can, you can spend a lot of money trying to find out exactly how much water and storage there is. You can do seat of the pants calculations, which, which I've done. And, um, but, but I think the, the way to get around spending a lot of money to come up with a number that people may start fussing about is simply to designate a proportion and a, and a certain pumping rate. Um, you know, Memphis gets to pump X cubic feet or gallons per minute. Mississippi gets to pump that amount and determine what amount of water can be sustainably extracted from the aquifer and sustainably is subject to uh, agreement among the parties and, and do it that way instead of trying to find out that there are a hundred trillion gallons in Mississippi should get thirty percent, you know, whatever. So I'd say go on a percentage basis or go on the basis of how much water, you know, like the maximum pumping rates, the total amount of water that can be pumped by Memphis is this or that. That that would that's what I would say. Thank you, Dr. Campana. Let's squeeze one more question in before we wrap things up. This final question goes to Professor Hall. Professor Hall, are you aware of other interstate groundwater disputes that could be affected by this Supreme Court decision? Oh, absolutely. Uh, the most immediate, uh, because it's the one, the other one front and center on the Supreme Court's agenda, uh, is the Apalachicola Chattahoochee Flint dispute primarily between uh, Georgia and Florida, to a lesser extent Alabama. And that dispute essentially puts uh, the competing interests of Atlanta's water supply against uh, Florida's desire to have more fresh water flowing in for its oyster, for its oyster beds. Uh, I think that would be one of the first disputes that would be affected because it's the one coming up the soonest. But big picture, Almost every shared interstate water body, uh, uh, the, the ground rules might be different, so to speak, from the Colorado River out west to the Delaware River and Susquehanna Rivers, which are critical for the large east city water, eastern city water supplies, uh, of course, the Great Lakes, uh, and then rivers that are not yet subject to either interstate uh, equitable apportionment disputes or interstate compacts such as Mississippi and Missouri, uh, those will now be essentially blank slates that the new law could be written on. So I think the implications of this case are tremendous. Um, I believe the U.S. Solicitor General understands the implications, actually advised the court uh, not to take the case and to let the established law stand. Uh, and that might still be the ultimate outcome. Uh, as Michael alluded to earlier, the big uncertainty hanging over the case is that we don't know the justices that will be deciding it, or at least uh, one of the nine justices that will be deciding it. And we certainly don't know uh, the views on shared and interstate resources from many of these justices. Uh, so there's a tremendous amount of unknown, uh, and um, I don't think we're going to see resolution on this case for uh, a full other year. I 
I don't think it'll, it'll be resolved in this coming Supreme Court term. I think it'll be the one after that. Thank you, Professor Hall. And that's all the time we've got for today. If you listeners have any remaining questions, please forward those questions to either Jeff or myself, and we will work together with our presenters to facilitate an answer for you. As one housekeeping note, we will be archiving Dr. Campana's presentation along with the webinar itself so that you can access the wonderful links and resources he has provided. We'd like to thank our excellent presenters for their contributions today, as well as our colleague at CSG, Carrie Abner, for her help with all the technical aspects of this webinar. Jeff and I also would like to extend our thanks to each of you for spending an hour of your afternoon with us. I hope you found this webinar both useful and informative. If there is anything that the Council of State Governments can do for you to support you in your work, please don't hesitate to contact us. Thanks again, and have a wonderful afternoon.